For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. This episode's part of a series I recorded at the Adobe Summit in Las Vegas, Nevada. My name is Anudit Vikram. I am the SVP of Audience Solutions at Dun & Bradstreet. Dun & Bradstreet is a commercial data company. Uh, we host about 300 million business records. And the Audience Solutions business at Dun & Bradstreet is designed to essentially take those offline business records, the commercial records that we have, and make them available for use for digital marketing and online advertising use cases. And my job is to essentially build that product and bring DNB into the digital space. Got it. Got it. So you're you're essentially helping marketers, if I if I understand it right, use the data that DNB collects and enrich or enhance their ability to market to the people they're trying to reach. Is that right? That is right. Uh, although okay. there's a nuance to it. Okay. Right. So enriching or enhancing data is um, more often than not used in the offline context, mm -hmm. where somebody has a CRM file and you know a, a record might not have the phone number or mm -hmm. the address might be not fully formed. And uh, we do have a product that allows you to take that CRM file and enrich or enhance it. Right. But what we are talking about in the audience solutions context is actually taking the record, whether it is enriched or not, or you know, the record exists, mm -hmm. but more importantly, using the data for uh, digital use cases. So, and the reason why we feel it's an important differentiation and something that we should kind of call out a little bit is because in today's day and age, the marketers, the B2B marketers are, have to address a market that is actually becoming driven more and more by the millennials and the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And research says that when a buyer is looking to buy a B2B product, about 87% of the buyer's journey is completed before the buyer actually talks to the seller. Wow. Right. And this 87% of the journey is for more often than not completed in the online space where they are downloading content from the internet or they're reading blogs or they are br searching for stuff and browsing websites. Mm -hmm. And so for the marketer to be effective, they have to be in that space and yeah. in front of the potential buyer when the buyer is not actively engaging with them. Right, right. Yeah. And then understanding intent uh, exactly. know, has to be huge. Exactly, <laughs> yes. So as you can imagine, I mean, this out, out on the internet, there are numerous uh, opportunities for somebody to consume content and if it's your content so take an example of you as a b2b marketer we'll just use a random example ibm mm -hmm. and ibm is selling cloud services right ibm sells laptops they sell servers they sell a bunch of other hardware and software and they also happen to sell cloud services so let's say that somebody landed up on an ibm website and ibm needs to make a decision on what content to show them Mm. Right, because in today's day and age, you know that if you don't engage with that person with what the person actually wants to be engaged with, then you lose that person forever. Right, so two things come into play at that point in time. There's an anonymous user at IBM.com, and you have to make a decision: Do I show them my printer, my server, my laptop, or my cloud service? Right. Now, the decision over there becomes. What kind of a company is this that's actually represented by the user? Mm -hmm. Is it a mom and pop shop? Is it a $10 million company? Is it a $100 million organization or a billion dollar enterprise? Right. And that's something that we kind of help you do by mm -hmm. identifying in real time what it is. So let's say that you identify that this is a billion dollar enterprise, which means you likely want to show your cloud services content to them. Mm -hmm. But every billion dollar enterprise is not in the market to buy cloud services. Mm -hmm. So if you could know something more about that company to say whether that company already has expressed an intent to buy your product, then you can make a more specific means of communication with that person right. and therefore hopefully sell your product much faster and more effectively than you would if you go through the typical sales cycle. Right, right. And how are you getting to intent? Is it a merging of the data that you're collecting mm -hmm. as well as the data that, that like IBM in this example has as well? Sure, yeah. That's a great question actually. And there are there are many different ways in which you can you get to intent. And the simplest way of getting to intent is having a method by which you can essentially scour the internet and people's consumption of content on the mm -hmm. internet. So 
So if you know that IP addresses that are representing certain companies are often showing up on web pages that have content related to cloud services and there are people consuming that content and the indexing of the company that is consuming that content as against a typical index mm. of that content consumption is different, then you can say that that company has shown an intent ah. in cloud services. Gotcha. Right? That's the simplest way and a lot of people actually go about doing that. But there is uh, there is something that people miss when, when you think about it that way. Cloud can have many different meanings, right? Mm. Like the Google apps are actually cloud services. So mm. when I use Google Drive or I use, you know, Google, I would forget the name of the apps. So I use Microsoft <laughs> Sheets actually. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> uh, but they're like Office 365. Right. I mean, it's yeah. a cloud service, right. really. Yeah. But then there is also the Amazon cloud service and the Google cloud service mm-hmm. and Azure and the Microsoft side. So there are different kinds of clouds. So just knowing that somebody was consuming content of for cloud service doesn't necessarily mean that they're interested in the mm. Google Cloud versus, you know, Google Notes or Google right. Keep or whatever that might right. be. So at that point in time is where we have a, we at DNB have a little bit of an advantage because we understand the firmographic mm-hmm. profile of the business pretty well, right. uh, which means that not only do we know that that person who that company was consuming a cloud content, but we also know that the company that was consuming cloud content is of a certain size, has a certain revenue, is in so many ge- geographic locations, you know, has the propensity to do X, Y, Z. And when we put all of that together, you can actually build a very strong intent signal, mm. which you can then make available to the B2B marketers who want to use it for got running their marketing programs. Got it, got it. And how has, um, I mean, privacy and data protection is a big mm-hmm. big thing now and with GDPR yeah. as one example how has that impacted your business well so I mean GDPR just because just with the way it was actually right. it came about it impacts many businesses in many ways right. but our take on GDPR and CCPA and all the other mm-hmm. privacy initiatives actually is that they are a very good thing yeah. right I mean uh, we unfortunately when, when you talk about the data game we had gotten to a point in the industry where there was starting to be a lack of trust in the quality and the validity of a data asset right. because there were many many small companies or many companies just coming up technology making makes it so easy to collect data and mm-hmm. then everybody can essentially just use the same underlying data set and then just put a little you know a little twist on it and start selling it right. and i think gdpr ccpa and these privacy regulations actually ensure that the people who are doing things right you know we we certainly believe a lot in doing things right people who are following the right norms understanding the con- the consent and the opt out mechanics and all of that mm-hmm. and are keeping that in mind will actually people who have true high quality data are actually going to become the ones that will be separated from the mm. chaff which is the low quality data right. so uh, to answer your question on how has it affected I don't think anybody yet knows the full effect because it is right. just coming into right. into full force right now but we feel very confident with uh, where we are as it relates to our data uh, data collection our data sets and our, our business on the whole got it got it well you know one of the things I talked to a lot of B2C marketers lately there have been some B2B ones too like mm-hmm. Steve Lucas from um, Marketo, uh, mm-hmm. of course, but um, CMOs, I think, are they're wrestling with this notion of how much do I bring in house mm-hmm. for many of these issues. I think yeah. like transparency issues and mm-hmm. things like that in terms of how data is collected, how is my media being bought, um, and I think on the media side in particular, there's yeah. this fight to bring some of that more mm-hmm. and more in house. Where do you see that today? And do you yeah. feel like there's a, an equilibrium that we can establish somewhere in the in the yeah, so future? You know, I realize this uh, very often. I give an answer. More, very often, I find that I give an answer which says it depends. Right. Right. And yeah. and this is another place where yeah. it depends. And what I've been, what I've seen so far, and I believe this is the trend that will continue, is that there will be, you know, the concept of in housing, mm-hmm. uh, but that concept is applicable to a small portion of the industry. Right. You have to have a business whose size is large enough right. that it makes in-housing worthwhile. Right. Also understand that uh, bringing some of your marketing functions or your media functions in-house is actually creating a whole new organization within the company which is not core to the business of the company, right? right. So either you have, you're a company big enough that you can just create a whole new shared business, service group shared yeah, service right, right. without really having impacting, you know, the rest of the business company, or otherwise you just 
don't do that. Right, right, right. right. Classic case, and since you mentioned B2C, you know, one, some of the new kids on the block or the latest fad is this thing called direct-to-consumer, mm-hmm. right? And we've oh, seen yeah. we've seen many direct-to-consumer brands kind of come up over the last few years. And if you notice, the largest, most of the direct-to-consumer brands as they were coming up were actually doing all of the media and all of the mm-hmm. marketing themselves. It was direct-to-consumer. There was right. no agency or there was nothing in the middle. Mm-hmm. But those brands that have actually gained scale are now starting to look at agencies, agencies. Yeah, yeah because it is it's not that easy right. to actually execute on this right. you know and um, again don't get me wrong i'm not saying that in housing is not going to happen i think still there are some some entities which will do pretty well with the in housing concept but i don't think it's just for the general mass and for everybody to do nice well one of the solutions as i was looking at your website was being able to reach b2b audiences via tv which mm-hmm. I hadn't thought of. I mean, you think of it when you see the golf tournaments and yeah. all the consulting firms have their yeah. logos on everyone's hats and clothes and yeah. all that good stuff. But I haven't thought about it in terms of addressable TV and some of the other TV mm-hmm. platforms that are out there. So how, you know, how in the way you look at it, how can B2B companies reach their consumer or their customers through TV? Yeah, so you know, I, I don't know if you notice it, but pretty much every single business has a bunch of TV screens around there. Like in my office, yeah, uh, you you true. you walk around the hall and you see a lot of TV screens. Yeah, you know, the kitchen certainly has TV screens, right? right? And um, the with in today's day and age, with the set top boxes, with the addressable TV, with connected TV, mm-hmm. with TVs having their own IP addresses, you know, with uh, folks like Roku and mm-hmm. Fourth Wall, uh, Fifth Wall, I forget the name, whatever. Right. And there, there are a bunch of these, which are essentially what we call as MVPDs. They, they are entities that are able to collect digital data signals, oh, yeah. which are then used by these boxes or by the right. connected TVs and so on. And so we are seeing. We certainly are seeing the use of data mm-hmm. in TV. In the B2C space, it's kind of pretty right. big right now. Yeah. And we are finding that uh, the same concept actually applies pretty well to B2B. There is value in understanding the audience, mm-hmm. right? Especially when you have TV boxes that are quite obviously in business locations, right? right? Or at airports mm-hmm. and so on, where, I mean, certainly there are, you know, consumers there, but right. the majority of the travelers, like on a, if you, if you look at the, if you do day parting, yep. you know, you look at the general business flying hours and then you look at the business flying days and <laughs> you, you know, you're going to be reaching business audiences on TV and it just, right. it's almost a no brainer right now. Gotcha. Well, let's talk about just some more gener- general things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you're thinking about you're building these products, but now you've got to market them, you know, what's top of mind for you as, you, as you're trying to, as your organization is trying to market its own services? What are you guys Top of mind for me. Well, yeah, that's, that's, I, I can, you said we have 20 minutes. That's yeah. not enough time to yeah. talk about my top of mind. But <laughs> A lot on your mind. All right, jokes aside. <laughs> well, I think, you know, for us, it's about data driven marketing. Mm-hmm. It absolutely is. You know, we, we have, I think there was a, it was either Forbes or someone, I don't, I don't remember who, who said something about data being the new oil. Mm. There is, it is the data economy today. And I think B2B marketers are waking up to the fact that uh, they can be very effective in digital channels. They can be very effective in targeted advertising. And there aren't many uh, data providers that can provide commercial data at scale. Mm. Also, B2B marketers, as like like we sp- spoke about just a little while ago, you know, the the buyer of that B2B service or product is becoming increasingly digital, and they are spending more and more time investigating products without necessarily talking to the marketer themselves, and therefore the marketer has to figure out how they can actually be in front of the potential buyer. Mm. Also. B2B has a very interesting nuance in the sense that while that 87% of the journey was actually completed digitally in the online space, the majority of B2B buys actually happen in the offline space, right? No, nobody, right. nobody goes right. and buys cloud services by just add to cart, check out, swipe right. my American Express. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't work that way, right? So, right. and also B2B buying cycles are very long. Mm-hmm. So, the concepts that have so easily been proven or that have been proven in the B2C space don't just transfer over to the B2B space. And there are these little differences that we have to make sure that are understood. Cross-device, cross-channel attribution becomes very important. The end-to-end, offline-to-online matching becomes very important. The idea of being able to roll up individuals into accounts becomes very important. You know, you, you don't sell a B2B product or a service to one person. You sell it to about six to eight different 
different people within a given company because there is always a buying committee there is not right. a single person that makes a decision so you you when you are talking to them you're talking to them as individuals but when you are measuring them and when you're looking at what you are doing as a marketer you're looking at them at at the account so to have this to be able to have some kind of a static persistent consistent identifier that spans your different channels spans the different platforms lives online as well as offline and allows you to create this holistic view at the individual level rolled up to the account level in all these different platforms and channels that's that's absolutely paramount to the b2b marketer and and that's that's what we think about and do all <laughs> all day yeah. it's a lot to lot to do it's Lots, a lot to do it's a lot to yeah. do Let's have a little fun. We'll ask a few questions. I like to get to know the person that I'm talking to as well. So I've got a couple of fun questions here. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? It could be about life. It could be about your career. Yeah. So this is something, and this is something which has stayed with me forever, which is, you know, don't, don't get really bogged down in the lows because it's always going to be a better day. <laughs> and at the same time, don't get too high on the highs because there's always going to be a worse day. <laughs> It's funny. I talked to somebody just a little bit earlier today, and this notion of balance came up as yeah. well in a different context. All this, yeah. all, all the same, but it's funny that balance <laughs> is a theme today. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the best source of information for you to just stay current? And um, you know, what what types of I, sources? do You know, you I don't think there's a single best source now. I, mean, I know there, there are there are a little too many sources actually. <laughs> yeah, way um, too many. I can see yeah, it in your way face. Too many. Yeah, And uh, you know, there, there's one thing I feel really bad about. I never caught on to this. Uh, the RSS feeds and all of the stuff uh, yeah, where you could actually uh, create aggregate this, your, yeah, own, feed, aggregate your yeah. own feeds. I've never really done that. So I just mm-hmm. bounce around on these different uh, <laughs> different websites. I have a bunch of newsletters that I subscribe to. And frankly, there's not enough time in the day to do all the reading that you need to do. Yeah. yeah. Is there any one that sticks out as, as one that, you know, while you're deleting all the other newsletters, you might actually look inside that one? It depends on the topic. Right. right? It depends right. on topic. So there is, um, I, I, I do read Ad Exchanger a lot, which okay. is about this digital advertising. Yeah, yeah. I land up reading Business Insider yeah. every so often. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm staying away from the typical Wall Street Journal, New York right. Times, which everybody reads. You know, right, that's a whole right, different right, story. Right. I, I land up reading Axios. There's mm-hmm. uh, there's a bunch of stuff that comes out there. There's a newsletter I get by the it's called the Operating Partner. It's by this person by the name Darren Herman. Mm-hmm. He has some really interesting interesting topics that he's always following. Yeah. And so I just go through the topics that he's following to see if there are some that I would like to follow. That's good. I know this person. He was the founder of uh, one of the original founders of LiveRamp, and then uh, now he runs this company called SafeGraph, which is another company that he's found. And uh, he sends me this email. I mean, I imagine he sends it to a bunch of people, but every on some frequency, I get an email which has all the interesting things that he's read over uh, the past, you know, X number yeah, of days. Yeah, yeah. He's curating again, I, it for I, you. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's already yeah. curated. I just go look at it. So yeah, <laughs> nice. there, there are a bunch of different places. That's cool. That's great. And uh, last question for you. One thing that you love, one thing that you hate or dislike a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that there is so much change all the time that there's always an opportunity to learn. Mm. It's amazing. Like the day that I feel that there is nothing left to learn is one of the most boring days ever, <laughs> right? So I love that fact. I dislike that things are changing at such a crazy pace sometimes that it's almost impossible to ever feel that you have kind of caught up to where you want to be. <laughs> so I'm always behind the eight ball, which is kind of sad. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It goes back to balance. I never get to that balance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners, and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Marketing Today.